Well, we get an allowance of $27 a week, mm -hmm. and uh, that's to do with, like, uh, say, cat beer or hamburger. Well, Great. candy. <laughs> From dating women twice his age at 15 to ultimately becoming the most influential artist of his era, Frankie Lyman's life was a whirlwind of unexpected twists and turns. Born into bustling streets of Harlem on September 30, 1942, Frankie emerged from humble beginnings, his journey marked by resilience and an unyielding passion for music. Growing up in a household where financial struggles were the norm, Frankie quickly learned the value of perseverance. With a father working as a truck driver and a mother employed as a maid, the Lyman family's shared love for music offered a glimmer of hope amidst the challenges of everyday life. Together, they harmonized in a gospel group known as the Harmonies, laying down the groundwork for Frankie's future in the world of music. By the time Frankie was 11, he felt like he had seen it all. While other kids were playing games, he was already working at a neighborhood grocery store trying to help his family make ends meet. But more than that, he was hustling with prostitutes for white men interested in black ladies from Harlem. I didn't have much time for being a kid, he once said. But amid the hustle and bustle of life in Harlem, Frankie found solace in his love for music. But could a kid from the streets of Harlem really make it big in the world of music? And at what cost would fame come knocking on his door? The streets of Harlem were rough, but they were also where Frankie's journey began. Little did he know, his voice would one day captivate audiences across the entire world. But fame would come at a cost, leading Frankie down a path filled with challenges and heartbreak. This is the story of Frankie Lyman, America's first teenage rock star. When Frankie was just a kid, barely out of elementary school, he stumbled upon something that would change his life forever. It was at a talent show in school where he first laid eyes on a group called the Coudaville. These kids, a mix of black and Puerto Rican, were belting out tunes like there was no tomorrow. Frankie was mesmerized. He begged them relentlessly to let him join. And finally, a month before his 13th birthday, they agreed. But Frankie wasn't handed the spotlight right away. No, he started as a backup in the group, harmonizing with the rest of the quartet. They went by different names over time, from the premieres to the harmonies before settling on the teenagers. And boy, did they live up to their name. Growing up in the vibrant streets of New York in the early 50s, singing on street corners wasn't just a pastime, it was a way of life. Frankie and his crew would serenade passersby at the grocery store every single day, their voices blending in perfect harmony until the neighbors couldn't take it anymore and called the cops. Frankie's mom would have to intervene, shouting for him to come home as the night wore on. But fate had other plans for Frankie and the teenagers. One day, a well-known singer named Richard Barnett of the Valentines moved into their neighborhood. They seized the opportunity to showcase their talent, singing their hearts out for him. Impressed by the raw talent, Barnett arranged for them to audition for G Records. Initially hesitant because they were just kids, the record company finally relented, but only on one condition. Frankie had to be the lead singer, not just because of his undeniable charisma, but also because of his incredibly beautiful voice. And so, with a stroke of luck and some legal paperwork signed by their parents, of course, the teenagers landed their first record deal. Their dynamic, with Frankie leading the pack, would later serve as a blueprint for Motown's early groups and even for the legendary Jackson 5. Their first hit, Why Do Fools Fall in Love, shot straight to the top of the charts, catapulting them into stardom overnight. Suddenly, Frankie and the teenagers were everywhere, on TV, in theaters, and even on parade floats as adoring fans clamored to catch a glimpse of the teenage heartthrob. But little did they know, fame would come with its own set of challenges, and not everyone in the group would reap the rewards. They weren't just another flash in the pan, they were the real deal, breaking barriers and winning hearts of all colors. Black, white, Hispanic, everyone was vibing to Frankie and the teenagers' tunes. Boris Levy, the savvy co-owner of G Records, saw their universal appeal and jumped in to manage the group alongside his partner. But as their fame soared, tensions simmered within the group, eventually leading to a split in 1956. During their whirlwind journey, Frankie found himself drawn to Zola Taylor, a fellow songbird from the famous group The Platters. Despite their five-year age gap, sparks flew between them, igniting a romance that would raise eyebrows. 
Frankie had a knack for attracting older women, finding them more attractive and less dramatic than the thousands of teenage fans who screamed his name. In interviews, Frankie was candid about his preference for older women, and to keep his image squeaky clean, he often passed off his girlfriends as relatives, mostly as his own mother, a tactic advised by his team to maintain his wholesome image. His first brush with showbiz romance came in the form of a nightclub dancer who he had hit as his mother during tours, a ruse that allowed them to travel together without causing a scandal. I mean, more than the usual. Frankie wasn't shy about his approach to wooing women either, charming them with his charisma and wit. Showbiz gossip spread like wildfire, with tales of Frankie's escapades making him a legend. Once, he barely avoided a close call when a newspaper reporter stumbled upon his double life, mistaking his different paramours from his mothers in different cities. With his silver tongue, Frankie managed to smooth over the misunderstanding, leaving the reporter still clueless. In the world of showbiz, where appearances were everything, Frankie walked a tightrope between fame and notoriety, navigating the highs and lows of fame with equal parts charm and audacity. His management smelled money in the air and decided to put all their chips on Frankie. Goldner, one of the owners of G Records, saw dollar signs and began pushing Frankie as a solo act, lining up gigs left and right. But as Frankie's star rose, tensions brewed within the group. During their European tour, Goldner made a shady deal, selling his stake in G Records to Boris Levy, a shady character with ties to the mob. What made matters worse was that Goldner claimed that Frankie and Santiago, another member of the group, had penned a hit song during the tour. The rest of the teenagers were left out in the cold, feeling sidelined as Frankie hogged the spotlight. To add insult to injury, a song titled Miracle in the Rain was released, with Frankie's solo vocals taking center stage while the group's contributions were brushed aside. The teenagers weren't having it. Trouble started among the group with fistfights breaking out and threats of strikes from fellow singers on the European tour. When they returned stateside, tensions boiled over and Frankie split from the group, leaving them in his dust. It was a heartbreaking betrayal for the group, who had once been like family. In September of 1957, Frankie embarked on a solo career, kicking things off with a hit called My Girl that snagged him a record deal. He even made an appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, a big deal back in those days. But behind the scenes, Frankie was struggling. His solo career wasn't the dream he'd hoped for, and those around him failed to see the toll it was taking. Meanwhile, the teenagers soldiered on without their former frontman, releasing a new song called Flip Flop with a new lead singer. But without Frankie's star power, their efforts fell flat and they faded into obscurity. It's a tale as old as showbiz itself, Frankie Lemon and the teenagers, once at the top of the charts, were torn apart by greed and ego, leaving them with nothing to show for their hard work but shattered dreams. Why do fools fall in love top the charts, but the teenagers never saw a dime of the profits? While artists like Diana Ross crooned their songs to fame, the teenagers struggled to make ends meet for the rest of their lives. Their career was a flash in the pan, barely lasting a year, while Frankie's solo journey fared slightly better but was marred by his own demons and the pitfalls of fame. Despite being portrayed as a squeaky clean teenager, Frankie's reality was far from innocent. He dove headfirst into a world of sex and drugs, starting with marijuana in grade school and graduating to heroin by the age of 15. The 1950s were rife with drugs, claiming many lives along the way, and Frankie fell victim to this terrible killer. The heartbreaking part? He was introduced to heroin by a woman nearly twice his age at a New York party, surrounded by fellow musicians indulging in the same vice. What started as innocent experimentation with skin popping quickly spiraled into full-blown addiction. Frankie never intended to get hooked, but once he dared to take that plunge, there was no turning back. As his record sales dwindled and whispers of his addiction spread, Frankie's once bright star faded into obscurity. He became a cautionary tale a symbol of the dangers lurking behind the glitz and glamour of showbiz. In the music industry of the late 1950s, drugs were rampant, but they were mainly indulged in by those in prominent positions. For Frankie, still a child at heart, the situation was dire. His voice was changing, marking the transition from boyhood to manhood, but no one seemed willing to guide him through this crucial phase. By the age of 17, he found himself abandoned, 
shunned by nightclubs, booking agents, and record companies alike. Adding to Frankie's woes was the fact that most people didn't even know he was black. When he made appearances on national TV, the audience was taken aback. TV executives, fearing a backlash, forced them to stay in their seats, with police officers standing guard. Yet, despite the scrutiny, Frankie remained the consummate professional. But fate wasn't done dealing blows to Frankie. In July 1957, during a live TV broadcast, he danced with a white woman on the show The Big Beat. The conservative South erupted in anger, leading to the cancellation of the show and the destruction of all evidence of the controversial episode. In 1960, Frankie made a valiant attempt to shake off his addiction, buoyed by the support of Bob Red Cross, his road manager, who took him under his wing like a father. Frankie moved into Bob's house on Long Island, hoping to kick his habit for good. And for a while, it seemed like he was making progress. But tragedy struck once more when Frankie's beloved mother, terminally ill with cancer, passed away. Devastated by her loss, Frankie found solace in drugs once again. His grief became unbearable and narcotics became his refuge. Bonding over their shared grief, Frankie and Bob sought comfort in each other's company. But despite Bob's efforts to save him, Frankie couldn't escape his fate. In the early 1960s, he found himself ensnared once again by the grip of addiction. As Lyman's record sales plummeted, his dependence on drugs only intensified. Unable to kick his habit, he watched helplessly as his once promising career faded into obscurity. No longer possessing the angelic soprano voice of his youth, he struggled to hit the high notes, resorting to lip syncing on TV appearances. At 19, Lyman checked into rehab in a desperate bid to get clean, but it was too little, too late. Boris Levy, his record label boss, dropped him from the label, severing his last lifeline in the music industry. Over the next few years, Lyman made sporadic attempts to get clean, but heroin always lured him back into its grasp. In a bid to revive his career, Lyman attempted to reunite with the teenagers in 1965, but the effort fell flat. He then bounced between short-lived contracts with various record labels, including 20th Century Fox and Columbia Records, but his star had long since faded. Amidst his professional struggles, Lyman's personal life was fraught with turmoil. He married Elizabeth Waters in 1961, but the marriage ended tragically with the death of their newborn daughter just two days after her birth. Lyman's subsequent relationship with Zola Taylor, whom he'd known since he was 13, was equally tumultuous. Taylor stood by him despite his destructive behavior, but their marriage in Mexico failed to last. By the mid-1960s, Lyman was a shadow of his former self. Struggling with addiction and unable to secure steady work, he wandered the streets of New York, his once celebrated status as a teenage star reduced to a distant memory. Desperate for a fix, he resorted to begging for loans from old acquaintances in show business, willing to trade whatever dignity he had left for a hit of heroin. Lyman's downward spiral reached its nadir in February 1966 when he was arrested for stealing drums from a recording studio to fund his drug habit. Despite proclaiming his innocence, Lyman's drug problem continued to escalate, leading to further arrests on heroin charges. On June 21, 1966, Frankie Lyman found himself in a desperate situation arrested for stealing drums to fuel his drug habit. Meanwhile, Boris Levy, once Lyman's manager, took advantage of his vulnerability, snatching up his publishing rights for a mere $1,500, a fraction of their true worth. Facing a judge's ultimatum, Lyman enlisted in the army, hoping for a fresh start. It was there he met Mia Eagle, a school teacher who would become his wife, offering him a chance at redemption. Despite his efforts to turn his life around, old habits persisted. Lyman would eventually go AWOL, absent without leaving to perform at local bars, eventually leading to a dishonorable discharge. Yet, during this tumultuous period, he found love once more with Amira, another school teacher. However, the allure of the music industry beckoned. Encounters with industry figures like Sam Bray lured Lyman back into the studio, determined to stage a comeback and prove his worth, but the odds were against him. Struggling with addiction and limited resources, Lyman faced an uphill battle. Despite his assurances and in interviews, skeptics remain unconvinced of his sobriety. Tragically, Lyman's optimism was short-lived. 
Found dead in his grandmother's bathroom on the eve of a planned recording session, he was just 25. His passing marked not only the loss of a promising talent, but also a cautionary tale about the perils of addiction. In the aftermath, the remaining members of the teenagers faced their own struggles, with two succumbing to overdose in the following years. Lyman's demise served as a stark reminder of the dangers of addiction, a fate all too common in the turbulent 60s and beyond. Years after his passing, Frankie Lyman's legacy endured, thanks to artists like Diana Ross who kept his music alive by re-recording his iconic hit, Why Do Fools Fall in Love? In 1998, a film chronicling his life brought his story to the big screen, and in 1993, Frankie and the Teenagers were rightfully inducted into the Hall of Fame. The honor extended further as Frankie earned a star on Hollywood's Walk of Fame, a testament to his enduring impact on music. However, even in death, Frankie's estate was embroiled in controversy. His inheritance sparked heated debates, especially since he never officially divorced any of his wives. With his name now worth millions, battles over his estate ensued, casting a shadow over his posthumous fame. Despite the commercial success of his music, Frankie himself never saw a penny in royalties during his lifetime. His manager, Boris Levy, had cunningly swindled him out of his publishing rights, leaving Frankie and his heirs empty-handed. Myra, Frankie's last wife, fought tirelessly for her share of his royalties, eventually winning a settlement close to a million dollars. But for the original members of the teenagers who penned the songs, justice remained elusive. Due to legal technicalities, they never received the compensation they deserved, while Levy walked away with a fortune. Frankie's journey from the streets of Harlem to national stardom was a quintessential rags-to-riches tale, albeit with a tragic twist. Despite his meteoric rise, he couldn't escape the challenges of his upbringing, succumbing to the grip of addiction in his later years. Nevertheless, Frankie Lyman's impact on music was profound. As the first teenage rock star, he reshaped the industry, paving the way for future icons like Michael Jackson, Diana Ross, and many others. His influence reverberated throughout generations of musicians, leaving an indelible mark on the history of rock and roll. Reflecting on Frankie Lyman's life, we see the intricate dance between fame and adversity. Born into humble beginnings in Harlem, his journey from singing on street corners to topping the charts was nothing short of remarkable. Yet, as fame embraced him, so did the shadows of addiction and turmoil. As we ponder Frankie's legacy, we're reminded of other artists who have walked similar paths. One such figure is Billie Holiday, whose haunting voice captivated audiences, but whose personal struggles with addiction and abuse cast a long shadow over her career. Like Frankie, Billy faced the harsh realities of life battling demons both within and without. Similarly, the story of Judy Garland parallels Frankie's in many ways. From her meteoric rise as a child star to her tumultuous adulthood marked by addiction and mental health struggles, Judy's journey was a roller coaster of highs and lows. Despite her immense talent, she grappled with inner demons that ultimately consumed her. And then there's Amy Winehouse whose soulful voice and raw lyrics spoke to a generation. Yet, behind the music lay a troubled soul tormented by addiction and self-destructive tendencies. Like Frankie, Amy soared to the heights of fame only to be ensnared by the pitfalls that awaited her. In each of these stories, we see the complex interplay between talent and turmoil, fame and adversity. They serve as a cautionary tale reminding us that success often comes at a price and that the journey to the top is fraught with challenges. But amidst the struggles and setbacks, there's also resilience and hope, a testament to the indomitable spirit of the human soul.